in plants. So in the earlier classes, we have seen the morphology where the fruit formation we had discussed. Okay. So here, what is a sexual reflection? We know that sexual reflection means the fusion of male and female gametes leading to the formation of zygote is called as a sexual reproduction. So here, the sexual reproductive organs are the flower. Sexual reproductive structure or organ present in the flower in present in the plant is a flower. So the flower have the two sex two reproductive structures. Those are called as Andrisham and Ganesham. Already we have discussed that Andrisham is considered as a male reproductive male sexual reproductive organ, whereas Ganesham is considered as a female sexual reproductive organ. And uh, there's a lot of diversity can be seen in the. Uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity can be seen in the structural organization of the reproductive structures present in the flower. And here we consider the product of sexual reproduction is the fruit and the seeds. The product of sexual reproduction is fruit and seeds. And here, the fruits are produced from ovules, while the ovary will develop into fruits as a result of post-fertilization changes. Post-fertilization changes means the changes which are taking place after fertilization are called as post-fertilization changes. Then there's a lot of uh, morphological and embryological marvels in the process of sexual reproduction. So here we are going to discuss about how the changes are taking place during the entire process of uh, sexual reproduction. Here in this, we are going to study about the embryological changes. embryological changes that are taking place during the process of sexual reproduction. So here, what do you mean by this embryological changes? What do you mean by this embryology means? Starting from the formation of gametes till the formation of embryo is called as embryology. Starting from the formation of gametes, that is both the male gametes and the female gametes, the <clears throat> process of fertilization where the fusion of male and female gametes is taking place, resulting in the formation of the zygote and development of zygote into the embryo. All these changes is called as a embryology. Okay. So here, uh, before going to the changes which are taking place, so let us discuss about the pre-fertilization structures and events. Pre-fertilization means the structures which are present before the fertilization process. Pre-fertilization structures and events. So pre-fertilization structures and events means once again we have to discuss about the <coughs> reproductive structures that is the flower. Generally, we know that uh, the plant will have two type of stages. One is called as vegetative growth or vegetative stage, during which the root stem and leaves are produced. But once the plant uh, undergoes some sort of hormonal and structural changes, so that here the floral parts are, the vegetative parts are converted into the floral parts. Generally, because of the hormonal and structural changes what happens here it is the shoot uh, 
<coughs> apical meristem, the shoot apical meristem will be converted into floral primordium. Converted into floral primordium. That is what we call it as differentiation and the development. So the shoot apical meristem, which is uh, helping the formation of the vegetative structures, will undergo some sort of differentiation and changes in its structure, leading to the formation of the floral primordium. And we know that here that is leading to the formation of inflorescence. And uh, the inflorescence will have the floral buds. Inflorescence will have the floral buds, and these floral buds will give rise to the flowers. These four numbers will give rise to the flowers. And every flower will have basically four parts, calyx, corolla, andrisium, and ganesium. So in this part, we are not concerned with the andrisium, uh, we are not concerned with the calyx and corolla because those are non-essential parts. We are mainly concerned with the two structures. Those are called as andrisium and ganesium. So andrisium is represented as capital A and considered as a male reproductive structures and uh, gynesium or the pistil represented as capital G and considered as a female reproductive structure. Female reproductive structure. So here these are two structures that we have to uh, know that we have to know about the structure of these two and uh, how the changes are taking place. That is how the differentiation development is taking place in these two structures. We are going to discuss in this part. So let us start with the first one, andrisium. The individual parts of andrisium are called as stamens. Okay, and uh, stamens will have two parts mainly. The long elongated part is present. So this long elongated structure, which is considered to be stalk-like structure called as a filament. And the tip, it has a swollen part called as a anther. And here, this the lower part is attached to the thalamus of the pedicel. Attached to thalamus of the pedicel. And uh, the side which is attached to the thalamus is called as a proximal region. This side is called as proximal part. And this side is called as distal part. So the proximal part of filament is the one which is, which is attached to the thalamus. And distal part of the filament is the region which is attached to the anther. Or the nearest part to the flower axis is called as proximal part. The farthest part from the flower axis is called as a distal part. And uh, here, <clears throat> depending upon the attachment patterns, so sometimes the anther is, uh, the filament is attached to basal side of the basal side of the anther, we call it as basal fixed. So in this diagram, we can see the basal side. So the filament is attached to the basal side of the anther. Sometimes they may be uh, dorsi fixed also. So attachment will be on the dorsal side. So likewise, different types of attachment patterns can be seen. And here in the anther, we can see two lobes in this diagram, okay? So depending upon the number of lobes, the anthers are of dithecus, which is most common one, where two anther lobes are present. Two anther lobes are present. And here, if you take the section of this anther lobe, that means if you cut the anther, we can see this type of organization.
So this is one anther lobe, and this is a second anther lobe. And in each anther lobe, we can see two empty spaces. And in this anther lobe also, we can see two empty spaces. So these are called as the pollen sacs or pollen chambers. So there are two pollen sacs or two pollen chambers in each anther lobe. And in the second one also, two are there. So total in Dithika Santa, four pollen sacs are present. These pollen sacs are otherwise called as pollen chambers or microsporangiums or microsporan plural microsporangia. They are known with different names, pollen sacs, pollen chambers or microsporangia. And inside this uh, microsporangia, the microspores are present. Many, some thousands of microspores are present. So where these are otherwise called as pollen grains. So microspores or pollen grains are present inside the microsporangia. And here, uh, these are on the corners. These microsporangia are on the corners of the anther. So here, we consider this as four are present. So we call it as tetrasporangiate type. Tetra means four. Four microsporangia are present. That's what we call it as tetrasporangiate type of pollen sac or the dithicus anthus. And uh, it is most common type. Commonly seen in many examples like in Datura. Whereas in some cases, we can see only one anther lobe called as monotheca anther, which is uh, seen very rarely. Examples like in China rose, that is hibiscus rosa sinensis, have, have only one anther lobe like this. And if you take the section, so as only one anther lobe is present, if you take the transfer section, only two pollen chambers are present or two pollen sacs are present in total. As only two pollen sacs are present, we call it as a bisporangiate. Bisporangiate type of structure. So bisporangiate type. So likewise, depending upon number of uh, anther lobes and pollen sacs, so the two conditions are there. So dithecus with two anther lobes, monothecus with single anther lobe. Dithecus anthers will have two anther lobes with uh, each anther lobe with two pollen chambers. So total will be four pollen chambers. Whereas in monothecus, only one anther lobe is present. And as we know that one anther lobe will have only two pollen chambers. So we call it as bisporangiate type of structure. Then In between the two anther lobes, we can see a long elongated groove in this diagram. So can you see this groove-like structure, which is connecting the two anther lobes? So this long elongated groove is present, okay? A longitudinal groove is present between two anther lobes, which will separate the Two anther lobes or two thecas. And uh, there's, an there's an structure which is connecting both of them. We, can we consider this structure as a connective also. Connective is a tissue which connect the two anther lobes, two anther lobes. So now let us see the structure of the anther. <coughs> anther have two parts mainly. One is called as anther wall and second part is called as sporogenous tissue. Sporogenous tissue. And this anther wall is differentiated into four parts. Those are epidermis, <coughs> epidermis, 
and Otisium. Middle layers and uh, tapetum. And this porous tissue is the one which is giving rise to microspore mother cells. And from the microspore mother cells, they produce the tetrad of microspores leading to the formation of pollen grains. Actually, these are the other name for the microspores itself is the pollen grains. When they are present in the group, we call them as microspores. When they are uh, separated out, we call them as a pollen grains. So let us start with the structure that is anther wall or microsporangial wall. So if you take the structure of the anther total, the anther will have this type of organization. So it have uh, this type of uh, four corner structures will be present. One, two, three, and four. So if you if you cut it, so this is one anther lobe. This is second antelope, and this part will contain the connective. Connective with the tissue which is connecting this anther, one antelope with the other anther lobe. So, if we take the structure, the outermost layer is present like this. So, this outermost layer is called as a epidermis. Generally, this epidermis is a single cell tick that is it is made up of single cell uh, one uh, layer of cells and cell wall of the cells is thin walled and here all the cells are similar in its structure but in between the pollen sacs so this is one pollen sac this is a second pollen sac of this anther so between the two pollen sacs the cells are little bigger in size like this. And they have thin cell walls. So this, these cells are called as stomium cells. Stomium cells. The cells of epidermis present between pollen sacs are large in size or big in size and have thin cell walls. So such type of cells are called as stomium cells. And what is the specialty of the stomium cells means these cells help in dehiscence of anther wall between the two pollen chambers. These cells help in dehiscence of anther wall. So these are the characteristic features of the first part that is called as epidermis, which is single cell thick, cell wall is thin walled, and uh, the cells, all the cells are uniform, but except in the uh, <coughs> except in the region where uh, region between the two pollen sacs where the cells are large and thin wall such type of cells are called as stomium cells and helping the dehiscence of anther wall and here these cells are uninucleated each cell will contain single nucleus in them okay then the second part is called as endothelium endothelium so Below this one, we can see some big cells. So I will draw a diagram here representing the endothelium cells. So consider this as epidermis. I'm taking one pollen sac here. So epidermis.
chromium cells. Okay. And below this epidermis, just below the epidermis, we can see little big size cells than that of the epidermis. These cells are called as a endothelium cells. And these cells will have some specialty on its uh, cell wall. They have fibrous thickenings, radially elongated fibrous thickenings are present. Radially elongated fibrous thickenings are present on their walls. Okay, so this is a second row of cells, second row of cells in anther wall. They have radially elongated fibrous thickenings on their walls. On their cell walls, and here the special. What is the specialty of these uh, fibrous thickenings? Means these fibrous thickenings will help in hygroscopic nature. So, what do I mean by this hygroscopic nature? Means hygroscopic nature means so whenever the atmosphere is dry, they lose the water, and whenever the atmosphere have humidity, they will absorb the water. So that is the ability to absorb and uh, the ability to lose the water according to environmental conditions is called as hygroscopic nature. Okay. The cells lose water in dry conditions and absorb moisture. in humid conditions. So that condition is called as a hygroscopic nature. Because of this hygroscopic nature, that is whenever the atmosphere is dry, the cells will lose the water. When they lose the water, the cells will contract. The cells will contract in dry condition. And Gap is formed between the cells. Gap is formed between the cells. When the gap is formed between the cells, that will be leading to the that will be leading to the uh, break breakdown of the or that will be break, uh, leading to splitting of the anther wall. So they are helping in dehiscence of anther wall. Dehiscence of anther wall and uh, releasing of pollen grains. Release of pollen grains. Whenever the pollen grains are mature, they are released, okay? So that is a characteristic feature present in the endothelium cells. And the third one is <coughs> middle layers. So epidermis is one celled thick, Endothelium is also one celled thick, whereas here middle layers are many celled thick. Okay, many celled means they are ranging from one to five layers. One to five layers. So this structure from here to here, we call it as middle layers. Middle layers are generally one to five cell thick, and they have thin cell walls. And here, no particular specific function pertaining to the middle layers. 
but some they consider they are also helping in decisions of answer, but they have no specific function to be performed. So such type of layers are called as middle layers, which are present between endothelium cells and the tapetum cells. And the fourth one is the tapetum cells. So tapetum cells are present inner side, or we consider this as a innermost structure of the anther wall. The fourth region or innermost layer of anther wall. Here, these tapetum cells also have thin cell wall, but they have abundant cytoplasm in them. Abundant cytoplasm in them with a conspicuous nucleus that is clearly seen a uh, nucleus can clearly visible nucleus can be seen and the nucleus number will be ranging to by to multi nucleated condition that is definitely the number of nucleus will be more than one minimum it, it is two sometimes it may be ranging up to many nuclei so by to multi nucleated condition can be seen so, so that is a specialty of the tapetum cells apart from this special character they also have one other uh, uh, nature that is they are providing nourishment to the developing microspores. So where are these developing microspores are present means these developing microspores are present inside the Tapetum. So this is a pollen sac, actual pollen sac. Okay, inside this one, they have the sporogenous tissue. This sporogenous tissue will be converted into microspores. So that is during the formation of my sporogenous tissue to the microspore mother cell, from microspore mother cell to the microspores, they require some nutrition. That nutrition is provided by the tapetum cells. So this is, these are the tapetum cells. These tapetum cells are providing nourishment to the developing Microspores. Nourishment means food materials to the developing microspores. So that is other uh, important function related to the microspores. Uh, one more important function related with the tapetum wall. So these are different types of layers which are present in the wall of anther. Next, next coming to the second part, that is the sporogenous tissue. And where does this sporogenous tissue is present means? Sporogenous tissue is present inside the tapetum. So it is <clears throat> present inside the tapetum and uh, it is present in the pollen sac, in the pollen sac. And this tissue is diploid tissue. That means every cell contains two sets of chromosomes. And what about the condition of uh, ploidy condition of anther wall means epidermal cells are also deployed endothelium cells are also deployed tapetum cells are also deployed along with middle layers are also deployed in the nature so the sporogenous tissue are also deployed in nature this sporogenous tissue will gradually undergo division they divide to form microspore mother cells. So how can we show this one is the sporogenous cells will be converted into microspore mother cells. These microspores mother cells will undergo a process called as a, a process of division called as meiosis to form into microspores and the microspores are held together and four are present. So we call it as tetrad of microspores. Tetrad of microspores. Okay. <clears throat>
then here the microspores are arrangement will be like this it will have we can see three cells on one side and the fourth cell will present on the back side so total four cells are present so one two three and four will be on the back side and these this type of arrangement is called as a tetrad so because four cells are formed and one more thing uh, we can uh, we know that whenever a cell undergoes meiosis it is leading to formation of four daughter cells and here the cells of the cells of microspore mother cell are deployed where are the microspores are haploid in their nature so microspore sporogen cells are deployed microspore mother cells are deployed and microspores are haploid in their nature and each of the cell is haploid and here the microspore mother cell is undergoing meiosis so that's why we can call it as we can call these cells as meiocyte cells so what is a meiocyte means the cells so the cell which is undergoing meiosis is called as a meiocyte cell the cell which is undergoing meiosis is called as meiocyte cell and uh, the cells which are formed as a result of meiosis are called as meiospores so microspore mother cell is called as a meiocyte uh, microspore mother cell is called as meiocyte whereas the microspores are called as a meiospores meiocyte is a cell which is undergoing meiosis and meiospore is a, are the cells which are formed as a result of meiosis okay so this, this is a way how the microspores are formed and these microspores are held together for some time so with the help of a tissue called as callose tissue callose tissue is present in the callose tissue is present between the walls uh, between the uh, walls of this uh, microspores so which are helping in holding of this microspores in the group and after some time the callus will disintegrate and all the four microspores are separated out and now we call those structures as the pollen grains we call those structures as pollen grains so here that is from one microspore mother cell a total of four micros four uh, pollen grains are produced and this process is total is called as microsporogenesis that is <coughs> starting from microspore mother cell okay or otherwise the formation of microspores from microspore mother cell by meiosis is called as microsporogenesis microsporogenesis so this is a process which is leading to the formation of the microspores okay and here when the microspores are formed or uh, by the time the microspores are converted into pollen grains now it gradually the anther wall become mature so whenever the anther wall become mature <coughs> this the cells the gap present between these two pollen sacs the cells of this uh, uh, epidermis that is uh, stomium cells will gradually disintegrate so that a gap is formed so that uh, now the diagram can be shown like this so the gap present between the pollen sacs will be separated so that the two pollen sacs of the anther so these are the two pollen sacs of the anther they have been combined now so now it appears to be like one pollen chamber so this also appears to be like a one pollen chamber now here we can say that tetrasporangiate <coughs> tetrasporangiate condition is now appears to be like a 
by sporangiate condition. Okay, now inside which we can see the pollen grains, which are ready to be released, which are ready to be released. So this is the way how the pollen grains are ready to release. This type of changes are taking place during the development of the micro or development of male structures. So here in this process, how does it is taking place means the stomium cells are broken down. So that is because of a losing of water. So as already we said that uh, the stromium cells will help in the essence of anther wall along with the endothesium cells. The endothesium cells, as we said that they have the hygroscopic nature. That is, they will lose the water uh, during uh, <clears throat> dry conditions. So that is what we call as dehydration will be taking place, okay? Due to the dehydration, that is loss of water. Dehydration, uh, the microspores, the, mi the microsporangium will break. Dehydration of cells of anther wall leads to breaking of the anther wall and release of pollen grains, releasing of the pollen grains. So here, let us see what is a pollen grain and how it, uh, what type of structure it is having. Coming to the pollen grains. Pollen grains are formed from the microspores, okay? And these pollen grains are considered as the male gametophyte. The pollen grains will represent the male gametophyte generation. That is haploid generation, which is present in the life cycle of the angiosperms of, or the flowering plants. So it is represented in the male gametophyte. So here the pollen grains does not have, this is considered as a second uh, stage. So first stage is a sporophyte and the second stage is a gametophyte. Sporophyte will have the plant body-like structure, whereas the male gametophyte does not have the plant body-like structure. It is represented with only few cells, represented by few cells. Male gametophyte is represented by few cells, which are present in the pollen grains. And here, these pollen grains are generally microscopic in their nature. That is, we cannot uh, see their complete structure uh, with the help of naked eye. So we need a microscope to observe the structure of these pollen grains. And there's a lot of diversity in the structure, shape, color, and design pattern in the pollen grains. There's a lot of diversity in the architectures of the pollen grains, okay? So here, generally, my, as I said, the pollen grains are microscopic in nature. We cannot exactly see the complete structure of the microscope with, with, uh, without, the micro, uh, without the help of the microscope. So here, uh, these are generally spherical in their nature. Most probably, these are spherical in shape with ranging from 25 to 50 micrometers in their diameter. And if you observe the structure of this uh, pollen grains under the microscope, we can see two layers or two wall layers are present. So those are called exine wall and the intent wall. Two wall layers are present. One is exine, called, uh, otherwise called as exosporium. And second one is called as a in time are called as endosporium, okay? So exine is the outer layer, outer wall layer, which is chemically made up of a chemical called as sporopollenin. It is made up of a chemical called as sporopollenin, whereas in time is the inner wall layer, 
which is made up of pectocellulose that is is made up of pectin and cellulose so let us see the structure of the pollen grain uh, diagram of a pollen grain okay <clears throat> every pollen grain as i said it is nearly spherical in structure with a hexane wall So this is exane wall or exosporium. So this exane wall have some uh, unique features uh, which are providing to the <coughs> pollen grain. So that is due to presence of the sporopollen in it. Due to presence of sporopollen, it is resistant to the organic materials. resistant to organic materials and it can withstand <clears throat> high temperatures so due to presence of sporopollen the pollen grain is resistant to organic materials the pollen grain can withstand high temperatures it can withstand the strong acids. So it is resistant to the strong acids also. Then apart from the all uh, acids, it is resistant to alkali materials also, alkali materials. And uh, no, no enzyme can degrade the sporopollen. So undegradable. to the enzymes. They are undegradable to the enzymes. And not only that thing, the pollen grains are preserved in the form of fossils due to the sporopollen. Preserved in the form of fossils due to presence of sporopollen in the exam wall. So these are the unique characteristic features which are exhibited by the pollen grain due to presence of sporo sporopollen in its exine wall. Okay. So now the second layer is called as intine. And one more thing, uh, intine is made up of a chemical called as pectin and cellulose. And uh, this intine is generally thin in its nature. made up of pectin and cellulose. So here, before going to this intine, one more point had to be noted regarding exine wall. So in this diagram, can you see that some thick regions are there here? And okay, at the same time, some thin regions are there. So the, the thin regions where the, where the sporno, sporopollen is absent, those regions are called as germ spores. germ pores. So the part, some circular regions, circular regions of exine where sporo, sporopollen is absent or sporopollen deposition is not present. Those areas are called as a germ pores. And germ pores are the region, germ pores are the region from where the pollen tube formation will be taking place. Pollen tube formation will be taken. That is, the exit, the exit wall will, bro will be broken from the germ pore region so that the intent will push it from that one. Intent will push it from that uh, germ pore region so that intent will be converted into a pollen tube. Or uh, simply to say, germ pore is a region from where the pollen tube formation will be taking place. So coming to intent, which is thin, Second, second cell wall layer, which is made up of pectin and cellulose. 
and here this inclined bond is a continuous layer. layer. So why I am calling it as continuous layer? Layer means I will tell continuous layer. So here why? Because pectin and cellulose are continuously present here. They are continuously present here. Whereas in the exine wall, so in the thick thick regions, the exine uh, sporopollen is present, but here the sporopollen is absent here. So once again, the sporopollen is present here. So that is sporopollen is not continuously present in the exine wall, whereas in the intern wall, the pectin and cellulose are continuously present. That should be called as a continuous layer, which is made up of cellulose and pectin. And inside this uh, intern wall, okay, one more thing, intern wall will help in the formation of pollen tube. Help in the formation of pollen tube during the germination of pollen grain. During the germination of pollen grain. That means when the pollen grain falls on the stigma, the pollen grains will start germinating. Germinating is nothing but it is giving rise to the uh, tube-like structure called as pollen tube. And uh, inside this uh, wall, inside the entire wall, one living membrane is present. So this living membrane is called as a plasma membrane, okay? Okay, here it is present inside it to intine wall. And uh, this plasma membrane is also uh, uh, considered to be the uh, structure which is a living membrane and as like that of the plasma membrane of a normal cells present in the plant body. Okay, and here inside this uh, plasma membrane, we can see the presence of a large vacuole in the center and a nucleus on one side. And this remaining part is occupied by the cytoplasm. So this contains the cytoplasm, a large vacuole in the center and nucleus. Okay, so cytoplasm, a central, large vacuole with a haploid single nucleus. Haploid single nucleus is present inside the <coughs> pollen grain, inside the pollen grain. So this type of chain, this type of characters can be seen here. And apart from this one, uh, but the pollen grain, whenever it is formed inside the anther, that is, as I said, that whenever it is ready to release like this, okay? So here we consider it as development of the male gametophyte. Development of the male gametophyte. So here, uh, only a single haploid nucleus is there, no? That single haploid nucleus will undergo the nucleus of the pollen grain will undergo mitosis to form into two nuclei. Those, those are called as vegetative and the generative nuclei or vegetative cell and generative cell. So vegetative cell is the large cell, whereas generative cell is the small cell. Okay. So here during this process, during this process, <coughs> the asymmetric spindle will be formed. Asymmetric spindle. Actually, we know that during the cell division, that is the during the uh, division of the nucleus, the spindle apparatus will be formed, which is symmetrical, equal in its nature. But here, these are uh, here, asymmetric spindle will be formed, leading to the formation of a large vegetative cell and a small generative cell. Then, here, vegetative cell is bigger in size with abundant uh, uh, food 
results in it. Abundant food materials are present inside the vegetative nucleus. And here the uh, nucleus of the vegetative nucleus is irregular. Irregular nucleus is present in the vegetative cell. Whereas in the uh, generative nucleus, which is small, and it have the uh, cytoplasm here, it is having the spindle shaped nucleus. And the dense cytoplasm is there. Okay, it is, uh, spin it is having a spindle shaped structure with uh, dense cytoplasm. And one more thing that the generative nucleus is always floating or generative cell is always floating in the vegetative cell. It is floating in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. So likewise, when this is a nucleus with a single nucleus, so when it is divided, by mitosis forming into two celled structure with a large nucleus and a small nucleus. So this large nucleus is called as vegetative cell and the small nucleus contains structure is called as a generative cell. Okay, so here the, this is called as two-celled stage of male gametophyte. Two-celled stage of male gametophyte. At this two-celled stage, uh, the pollen grains are released from the anther. So at this two-celled stage, pollen grains are released from the anther. And out of all the angiosperms, 60% of angiosperms, in 60% of angiosperms, Uh, pollen grains are released at this stage. Pollen grains are released at two cell stage. And further division will be taking place where the generative nucleus will divide to form into two male gametes. forms two male gametes and the generate vested nucleus. So here also once again, the mitosis will be taking place. Okay, so here, the generative cell undergoes mitosis to produce two male gametes. Now, here they have three, three cells, one, two, three nucleus we can consider, one, two, and three. So we can consider this as a three-celled stage. Three-celled stage of male gametophyte. So what is the maximum number of cells present in the male uh, gametophyte of angiosperms means three cells, okay? Uh, in remaining angiosperms, remaining means we said that 40% in 60% of angiosperms, the pollen grains are released at the two cell stage. And the remaining angiosperms, pollen grains are released at, this, at the three cell stage. Pollen grains are released from anther at three cell stage. At three cell stage. So, depending upon the nature of the plants, so the pollen grains might be released at two cell stage or at the three cell stage also. Whatever may be. So, that means, for example, if the pollen grains are released at two cell stage, so after reaching the 
uh, what do you call the stigma, the further division will be taking place where they form the three cell stage. Okay, so that means sometimes uh, the, the division is taking place before pollination and sometimes after pollination also. So that is the change which is taking place here. And what is the significance of pollen grains? So, so significance means uh, we know that pollen grains are the structures which are helping in the uh, for, uh, fertilization and uh, uh, formation of the fruits and the seeds. But sometimes in some cases, these pollen grains are uh, harmful to the humankind also. Okay, so sometimes uh, some of the pollen grains are causing severe allergies in human beings. So which type of allergies are caused means mostly the respiratory allergies are caused like bronchial afflictions are taking place. Bronchial afflictions. That is respiratory problems will be taking place. That is like chronic respiratory problems or disorders. Chronic respiratory disorders may occur like asthma and <coughs> bronchitis. Like asthma and bronchitis. Etc. And here uh, there is a plant called as Parthenium hysterophorus. So it is commonly called as carrot grass. Called as commonly called as carrot grass. This plant was actually is not native to India. So this have been uh, brought to India. So because of contamination of the wheat plant, whenever the uh, wheat plant is imported, so along with the wheat plant, wheat plant, the, this Congress grass plant also when introduced to India, which is uh, one of the major cause for the pollen allergies. Pollen allergy in the human beings. So this is the negative side of the pollen grains, but at the same time there's an uh, usage uh, significance in terms of uh, uh, usage is also been there. Like uh, these are uh, used as a food supplements, rich in nutrients. Pollen grains are rich in nutrients and used as a food supplements to the humankind and also to the animals. So here, uh, in some of the cases, these are the available in the form of pollen tablets, or particularly in the Western countries. Western countries. So pollen syrups and pollen tablets are available. Pollen syrups and pollen tablets are available. These pollen syrups and pollen tablets are uh, increasing the performance of athletes and the uh, horses. These pollen uh, tablets and pollen syrups are helping in increase in the uh, performance of the athletes and the horses. Okay. So here, this is about the positive impact and the negative impact of uh, the pollen grains, which are uh, causing some allergies and sometimes they are in some, not the same one, but different types of pollen grains are used as a uh, food supplements, which are providing uh, nutrients to the human beings and also to the animals. Then here, whenever the pollen grains are released, so uh, the pollen grains have to reach the stigma. Okay, so here, uh, how much time it will take to reach the stigma? It depends upon the different varieties of plants and also the environmental conditions because uh, <coughs> if similar type of uh, flowers are available nearby, they may reach to the right type of stigma. Sometimes they may reach to the wrong type of stigma also. What do you mean by this right type and wrong type means? Right type of stigma means uh, if the, poll if the uh, pollen grains are reaching to the 
stigma of uh, the flower which is belonging to the same species that is called right type and if they are reaching to the stigma of the flowers belonging to different species that is called as a wrong type so if they reach to the right type of stigma then only they will pollinate and uh, how much within how much time they have to be reach means that depends upon the viability that is ability to germinate on the stigmas uh, within that particular time period so that is very important that is called as a viability that is how long do the pollen grains retain their ability to germinate on the stigmas so here there is a lot of difference uh, <coughs> is there on uh, there is a lot of difference in the viability of the pollen grains like let us take the examples of uh, uh, rice and wheat and of course not only the uh, not only the viability de uh, depends upon the nature of the plant body but also it will depends upon the temperature and humidity present in that area so let us take the examples of rice and uh, wheat in these two plants the pollen viability is only for 30 minutes for 30 minutes that is within the th within 30 minutes of releasing from the anther they have to reach the stigma if they does not reach the stigma within the 30 minutes from re releasing from the anther they will not germinate on the stigma so that is that is a 30 minutes is a viable period in these members and next coming to the rosaceae leguminosae and solanaceae members in these members they maintain the viability for some months uh, then some they may retain the viability for some years also then is there any possibility of uh, uh, increasing the viability period of these uh, pollen grain species of course there is a process that is when the pollen grains are stored in uh, stored at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature so liquid nitrogen temperature is minus 196 degrees centigrade minus 196 degrees centigrade if they store them at this liquid temperature the viability period can be increased okay and here these pollen these pollen grains when they are stored in the liquid nitro temperature they are uh, preserved in the form of banks so we call them as a pollen banks as like that of the seed banks which are uh, helping in crop breeding process we know that seed banks are there where the seeds are stored which are helping in crop breeding so likewise the pollen banks are also available where the pollen grains are stored uh, where the pollen viability can be increased by keeping them in the liquid nitrogen temperature 